We would turn to Acts chapter 25. We are in Acts 25 here this evening. And if we recall, Paul has been now in jail in Caesarea for two years. He stood before Felix and preached about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, but Felix did not release him despite finding nothing that he could charge him with. He was there for two years, found nothing, but Felix wanted a bribe, and Paul wouldn't pay him a bribe. So Felix didn't let him go, and eventually, after two years, another man came into his place named Festus. And so Paul's basically having to start all over again. A lot of the times we, we run into that in this life where, where we're facing difficulties and struggles and we have a person who is assigned to our case, uh, whether it's with our government or whether it's with uh, the tax people or whoever it is, and then all of a sudden we get so close probably to getting it resolved and they either retire, they quit, they move on, and we're left with a new person and we gotta start all over again. Uh, because they want, they need to be up to speed. So now we have Festus, who comes and is now the governor of Judea. And so Paul has to deal with Festus, and Festus has to deal with Paul. You, have, you come in and you have criminals in your jail and you're gonna to wanna to know why are they in my jail? What have they done? And Felix is certainly going to tell him, well, he's here because the Jews want to kill him. But we really don't have a charge against him. And so it's not your problem. And so let's read verses 1 to 8, uh, through, uh, 1 to 8 of Acts chapter 25. And we'll start with Naomi and we'll go around to Tammy. Why don't we read two verses each through verse 8? About three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul, and they urged him. Asking a favor against him, that he would summon him to Jerusalem, while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself was going there shortly. Let them therefore say, if he that are of power among you, go down with me. And if there is anything amiss in the man, let them accuse him. And when he had tarried among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down unto Caesarea, and on the morrow he sat on the judgment seat and commanded Paul to be brought in. When he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and made many severe complaints against him, which they could not do. he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offered in any single So we have Festus here. What? Justice is not really Festus's main concern. What does it appear his main concern is? Because if it was his main concern, he would just let Paul go. What, what's he, if you were to take a guess as to what really his main concern is, what would he say? Who is he trying to please? We'll start with that. He was trying to please the Jews. And so we might say his main concern is politics. Because he did, he'd did he have a political problem if he let Paul go. Because he'd have a riot on his hands. He'd have the Jews, and just like they would, did to Pilate, just like they probably did to Felix, they threatened to go to Caesar and say that this man is letting criminals go. He is... He is letting people who want to teach about another king to go. And so Festus, he didn't want to look weak among the Jews, but he also didn't want the council to cause him trouble. So he had both, he had both concerns. He wanted to look strong because if he wasn't strong, he wasn't going to be able to do 
what he needed to do. You can't have a weak governor, especially when you have a Jewish council here that will run you over at any sign of weakness. But he didn't want the council to cause him troubles either because that would cause him troubles. So what did the Jewish council ask Festus to do in verse uh, 2 and 3? They want to try and ambush him. Bring Paul to Jerusalem. You have Paul in Caesarea. We're going to tell you about what Paul did, but please bring him here. We, you can almost see him standing there. We want Paul to hear, be able to respond to his defense. We want, we want to be fair to Paul. We're going to charge him, but we'd like you to bring him here so that he can hear the charges against him as if he didn't know them already. And so he gave it a defense, and it would be very convenient for us if you bring him here, but it's the same thing they wanted to do two years earlier. They just wanted an opportunity to ambush and kill Paul. Now, Festus wasn't going to be fooled. Festus didn't, uh, didn't fall for their trap. He said, no, he's going to stay in Caesarea. I'm going to go there soon, but... He's wanting to hear, says, tell me what the problem is. Tell me what the charges are. And the thing is, they still can't choose, or sorry, still can't prove all of the complaints against Paul. They've had two years to get the story straight. They've had two years to try to find proof, or at least to manufacture proof, because they really had no proof. Uh, to manufacture proof, and they couldn't do that. They couldn't prove it. Paul, in verse 8, gives the same defense that he has given before. So the Jewish council came up to Caesarea, in case we, in case we uh, miss that point. But Paul gave the same defense. So says, I've not done anything against the law of the Jews. I've not done anything against the temple. I've not done anything against Caesar. What am I doing here? I've not done any of those things. He's being kept, having done no wrong, only because the Jews hate him. And the Jews hate what he preaches. Any comments before we move on? Naomi, you, know, you want to get verse 9. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before we? Now, what a silly question to ask Paul. But Festus is, what, 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 what job would Festus have in a trial? What would Festus' job be in a trial? It's not going to be the prosecution. He's not going to be the defense. He's going to be the judge. He's going to be the judge. Do you typically get asked these types of questions from a judge? Do you want to go and be and stand trial? The judge isn't going to ask the defendant yet that. No, I want to be released. He says, "Well, do you want to go to Jerusalem?" The judge never asked that either. We don't. We, the judge usually the judge is the one who makes the judgment, who who makes the decisions. Judge, Festus knows the Jewish plan because I don't think Festus is stupid. And he still asks Paul. In other words, he was saying, he was saying, well, to Paul, maybe, maybe he thought Paul didn't know. But he was saying, well, if they kill him, at least it's not my fault. After all, Paul asked to go to Jerusalem. I didn't command him to go to Jerusalem. He wanted to go. This is politics, pure and simple. Festus was looking for a way out. He couldn't get a way out by releasing Paul. He really couldn't get a way out by keeping him either because he would have to answer for why they're keeping a Roman citizen without charge. He's stuck between a rock and a hard place and so he, I think very cunningly and craftily, tries to get Paul to be the reason he dies. And so it's very dangerous to Paul, but 
Paul is going to make, uh, you'd, you'd be amazed Paul didn't make, make this uh, request earlier, but Paul probably thought he had a chance with Felix to be released. With Festus, he's, Festus is a much different character than Felix. Felix seems to be able to be reasoned with. Festus doesn't. Festus is a very crafty, cunning, and sly character. And so Paul is going to be left with no choice. I mean, you want to get verse 10, and then 10, verse 11, and Bill, verse 12. But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where it ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. For if I am an offender, or have committed anything deserving of death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. And Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Okay, so Paul is basically frustrated with the judge. He says, I'm standing here before the judge, before Caesar's judgment seat, and you're refusing to judge me. You're a coward. You're not wanting to make a judgment. It, you don't want a problem. And he says, you know that the Jews, that I have done nothing wrong against the Jews. You know that I am, that you can't hand them over to me because I have done no wrongs. But he does say something. If I had done wrong, I don't, uh, you have every right to kill me. Paul is asserting here what he told the Romans in Romans chapter 13. That the government has the right to execute prisoners for wrongdoing. We, we today don't think governments have that right. We think it's barbaric. But God gave them that right. God gave them the right to execute. Now, the government could come along and decide that they don't want to. Okay, our government has, has declared that we don't execute prisoners anymore. The government has the complete right to do that. But it's not wrong to do that. Let's go to Romans chapter 13. Henry can get 1 and 2. Naomi can get 3 and 4. And Tamara can get verse 5. Of Romans chapter 13. And every shall be subject to the government authorities. As there is no authority except from God. And authorities said that it is appointed by God. Therefore, whoever receives the authority receives the ordinance of the God. Those who resist the bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for you. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, and avenger who carries out God's wrath on wrongdoer. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience. This verse still applies to us today, these sets of verses. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Yesterday was tax day in the States. It's a day that you see a lot of Americans moaning the fact that they have to pay taxes. I'm an American. I bemoan the fact that I have to file taxes in a country that I do not live, nor do make money in. But that's the that is the uh, right that comes that, that is the privilege that comes along with American citizenship, the privilege of filing taxes, even if you don't live there. But why do I do that? People might come along and say, "Well, you don't pay any taxes in the states. Who cares then?" It's the law. If I'm, if I'm a subject of the American government, and I am, then I have to obey its laws. I'm a subject of the Canadian government, I have to obey its laws. Where those laws don't contradict God's law. And paying taxes does not contradict God's law. No matter if we like what our government does with those taxes or not, governments will be, everyone's going to be judged for what they do. And people in power are going to be judged with what they do with that power. I'm not going to be judged for what Prime Minister Trudeau does, or President Trump does, or 
for the for the dictator of North Korea. I'm not going to be judged by that. I'm going to be judged by what I do. They're going to be judged for what they do. Uh, it's it's a cliche in a comic book, but with great power comes great responsibility, and that's true. But we have to be subject to the higher power. Recognize why do we have to be subject? Why why is it important? Not, not because God said so. That's not the answer I'm looking for. Who gave them the power? God gave them the power. And so that's why we need to be subject to those in authority. God gave them that power. And so to resist a God-given power is to resist God. God has delegated authority to govern. They are acting in the place of God by His authority. They're not God, but they are give, they are using power that God has given them. And so they are our rulers. We need to be subject, or we're resisting God. And we know resisting God is evil. But he, but Paul tells them, you have nothing to worry about if you do good, because generally speaking. What happens if you do good? Does your government leave you alone or you just throw you in jail? You usually leaves you alone. Now Paul is experiencing that exception. Uh, Paul had not done wrong, but he's it's as if he has. But usually, if we do right, the government leaves us alone. If we do wrong, we expect to go to jail. We expect to get fined. And he warns Christians here as well, the government has the right to kill. You don't have the right to kill. We don't have the right to kill. The government does. And so, be warned. The government doesn't bear the sword in vain. God has given them that right. And so if you do wrong, you should expect the punishment. And Paul is, in Acts 25, is saying, if I've done something worthy of death, kill me now. I won't fight you. Of course, Paul has not done something worthy of death, and he knows it. And Festus knows it. And the Jews know it. But that doesn't stop them. So, what does Paul do? Going back to Acts 25. What does Paul do? He appeals to Caesar. He appeals to Caesar. It's very interesting that he does this. Because under Roman law, you, as Roman citizens, had legal rights. Non-Roman citizens had hardly any rights. But a Roman citizen always had the right to appeal to Caesar. If they didn't like what the, the, the local government has done, they could always go to the Supreme Court. Us, that's like us going to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, that's, we have a legal right to appeal. Now they have the legal right not to hear our appeal. They could just deny it. But we have the legal right to appeal to them and have them hear our case. And should they hear it, we have the right to go before them. Paul used his legal rights, even though he was a Christian. A lot of times people think because we're a Christian, we're somehow barred from using the civil rights that we are given. We somehow can't go to court because we're going to court among uh, among people of this world. It's a misuse of 1 Corinthians 6, 1-8. 1 Corinthians 6, 1-8, I'm just going to summarize it. It's talking about Christians taking other Christians to court to sue them. And Paul was telling the Corinthians there, don't do that. Brethren should be able to settle disputes like that among themselves. Because we have a loving attitude towards our brethren, because we are to be, uh, we are to not, not be better in the sense of more more uh, arrogant and like as far as self righteous, but I mean we, we should know how to behave better. First of all, we should not be defrauding our brethren in the first place. Second of all, if we had, we should be willing to repay, and we should be willing to forgive. Those are all things that. Christians should do. And so, why are we taking our brethren to court 
if we should be able to solve those problems by ourselves, Paul tells the Corinthians, don't take each other to court to sue them. Don't do that. But, is Festus a Christian? No. Neither are the Jews. There's nothing wrong with, with taking other people to court if we can't settle the matter and they're not members of the church because they're not going to listen to the church. A Christian should be listening to his brothers and sisters. A person from the world is not going to care. And so Paul uses his civil rights, his legal rights here, to defend himself. But, even still, sometimes, even when we do those things, we might have to suffer wrongly. Paul, Paul's going to, this time, if history is any guide, go to Caesar and have his appeal heard and be released. But the second time, not so lucky. He'll be killed. Paul suffered wrongly. Just because we, we can take someone to court, or just because even if they're a Christian, we don't take them to court, doesn't mean that we're always going to get our way. Sometimes we have to suffer wrongly. Paul was suffering as a Christian, as 1 Peter 4, 14 to 16 says. Sometimes we have to suffer as a Christian, and Paul did. Paul has, and Paul will, uh, for the remainder of this book. So Festus agrees as well. You've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. Anything up to this point? Well, if not, let's continue on. We're going to find a new character. Uh, a character we haven't met yet. Uh, come into the picture known as Agrippa. Let's go down to verses 13 to 22. We'll start with Bill. Um, why don't we read three verses each? We'll, uh, we'll start with Bill and go around. And after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. The king had also smelled the castrum of the Romans to deliver any man to distractions before the accused is accused face to face and has an opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any complaint, the next day I said, Are the judgment is saved and the command that they to be brought in? The accusers to work because no accusation against the name of such things as as a person. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So, Festus is now, remember, this is, chapter 25 is happening pretty quickly. Festus has come in, he's installed as governor, and so now all the big political figures want to come and meet him. It's sort of like a new president or a new prime minister. All of a sudden they get calls from everywhere around the world. People come and visit him. How many people have come to visit the new president of the United States? Uh, they, they've had leader after leader after leader come. It seems like once a week he's meeting with a new leader because they want to get to know who this is. Now we have Agrippa here. Now Agrippa is the Herodian Jewish king. He's not king like Herod the Great is king. But he is sort of, he's underneath Festus, but he does have some political power. And this is King Agrippa II. And to know a little bit about his background, uh, let, let's go back and discuss who we do know uh, his relatives are. His great-grandfather was Herod the Great. That is the man who tried to kill Jesus. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Bill, Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Verse 16? Yes, please. Then Herod, 
<clears throat> when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So, we have here Agrippa's great-grandfather. Now remember, this would have been about 64 years earlier, around 64, 65 years earlier. So Herod's, the Agrippa's great-grandfather was Herod the Great, the one who tried to kill Jesus, the one who would die shortly after this. His uncle was a man named Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was the one who beheaded John the Baptist. Uh, who would come later. This would be the Herod that would be Herod during Jesus' ministry. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. Henry, do you want to get Mark chapter 6? You can get 22 to 25, and Naomi can get 26 to 28. Mark chapter 6. And when Herod the ass, the daughters who first came in and asked, the priest and Herod, those who sat with me. The king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my king. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And immediately she came in with, with his king and asked, see, I want you to give me at once the hand of John the Baptist, the one of them. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. This is Herod. This is Herod Antipas. And so he was again the Herod during the ministry of John and during the ministry of Jesus. And he was the reason John died. Remember, this is the Herod that divorced his wife and married, and married Herodias. That would make this girl, Salome, his stepdaughter who came in and danced. You can think how wicked that is, that you'd have your own stepdaughter uh, come in and dance for you, and this is a lascivious dance. And the way we can know it's a lascivious dance is the reaction of the men in the room. It pleased Herod. This is not the type of dance that is not sinful. He, he made a foolish oath. And Salome here went to her mother, Herodias. Herodias hated John, but again couldn't kill him because Herod was afraid of John because of all his following. But in the end, no matter what he did, he was going to sin. He made a vow, a foolish vow, like Jephthah did. And he had to honor his vow. Or, or had to honor his vow and sin. Or break his vow and sin. And he chose to honor his vow and kill John. He would rather, he would rather sin or the sin of murder than have his wife uh, on him for breaking his vow. It is this man that Jesus calls a fox. The way that, that's the way Jesus describes him. Tim, you want to get Luke 13, 31 and 32. On that very day some Pharisees came, saying to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Again, so this is what Jesus, Jesus knew of Herod, and this is how Jesus uh, perceived him. How does a fox act? When someone's described as a fox, what is their, what do we usually think of that about them? Sly, crafty, devious. So, that's what Jesus was describing. This would be the same Herod that would be that Jesus would be sent to uh, on the night uh, when Pilate, when Pilate uh, saw that he was from Galilee, he said, "Well, I'll take him to Herod. Uh, it's Herod's problem." And Herod, 
wanted to see a miracle, but Jesus wouldn't perform one, so he sent him right back to Pilate. This is the same Herod. And this is the uncle of Agrippa II. This man's father would be Herod Agrippa I. And that's the man who killed James in Acts chapter 12. And that's the man who was eaten of worms because he declared it because he accepted worship as God. And Josephus would even record Herod Agrippa's very painful death uh, in, in his writings. And even though Josephus doesn't call it up down as a curse from God, Luke does in the book of Acts. And, but it was, Josephus records it was a very painful death. It took five days for him to die. And so Herod Agrippa I is this man's father, which brings us now to Agrippa. Herod Agrippa II, he was married to Bernice, and as is often the case with politics, just as it is with kings and queens, there's a lot of intermarrying going around. That's how you keep power. You, marry, you intermarry into the political families. That way you can't have war with each other because you're all related. That's how a lot of people, that's how the alliance has worked in Europe for centuries. The different powers would have all of their children marry each other, and that's how they wouldn't go to war. And all, and you'd have many different alliances. So he's married to Bernice. He is the brother of Drusilla, Herod Agrippa is, who was married to Felix, if we remember from the last chapter. He was the former governor. So that's how uh, that's how uh, Agrippa is even related to through marriage to Felix. And so that brings us, uh, sorry, this is the man who Paul was standing before. He was a man who was involved in and knew the history of the Jews, because that's what Festus has a problem with. He said, the Jews are claiming he's preaching about a dead man, and yet this man here is saying he's alive. I know he can't be both dead and alive. I don't understand, because they're talking about their religion. And I just don't know what to believe. Agrippa would know. Agrippa would know about the Jewish religion. He would know about the things that had happened, even if he didn't believe them. He would have known, at least, had a little bit of a background. If we want to know the history of someone, we go to a historian who has studied this, might have lived it. Want to know about World War II? There are very few of them left. But veterans of World War II can tell you amazing stories that even the history books don't record. Uh, Vietnam veterans or Korean War veterans, same thing. We go to people who've lived it, and Herod's family, Agrippa's family, has been largely involved in the history of the Jews for the last almost 100 years. And so, who better for ha to have um, explained things? Festus declares to Agrippa and Bernice the Jewish complaints against Paul and how Paul appealed to Caesar. And so now that piques Agrippa's interest. He wants to hear Paul speak. And so they, they arrange that. They set that up for the next day. And so let's finish the chapter. That will bring, that'll allow us to start in the chapter 26 next week. Let's get 23 to 27 of Acts chapter 25. And we'll start with, I think it's Bill, right? Uh, let's, do, uh, let's do one verse each through verse 27. <coughs> So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said to King Agrippa, the Lord of men who are here with his eyes, you see this man who are the whom the Lord has the Jews, petition both at Jerusalem and Israel, crying out that he was not a fit to be any other. But I found that he had done nothing deserving that, and as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. I have nothing certain to write to my lord concerning him. Therefore I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. 
So we have this large group coming to hear Paul. We have a, we have Festus, we have Agrippa, we have Bernice, we have the chief captains, we have the principal men of Caesarea, and Festus stands up and says, oh, here we have Paul. He's a man who, a man who uh, Jews think has no right to live. He needs to be, he needs to be uh, executed, they say. But we found nothing worthy of death. He's appealed to Caesar, but I have brought you here today to listen to Paul. Because he has a problem. What's his problem? Same problem Felix had. He's going to send him off to Rome without what? Any charge. Any charge. He's going to, Paul has appealed to Rome. When you make that appeal, you're going to go to Rome. Now, he sends them to Rome with no charge. What's Caesar going to think? Paul's going to, stand, Paul's going to be standing before Nero, and he's going to say, and then Nero's going to say, well, where are the charges? Well, no one's standing. Where, where are your accusers? Well, they're not here. Then why are you here? And Paul will tell his story. And Festus didn't want that. And so he said, I'm going to let Paul talk. Maybe at the end of the day, I'll have something to tell Caesar. But verse 27, I find very, very funny statement. I find it unreasonable to send a prisoner with, to, to Rome without any charges. So do I. I find it unreasonable too. And I'm sure Paul does as well. And so chapter 26 is going to be dealing with uh, Paul's speech to Agrippa. And as I, as I alluded to last week, we have Felix's response uh, more for a more convenient season. Agrippa's response is going to be even worse than that as far as heartbreaking. Felix, we don't know ever found that convenient season. Agrippa's going to make a statement that is some, if it's possible, even worse than Felix's. And so the next next week, the Lord willing, we'll take up with Acts 26 and verse 1.